Hemoglobin is the primary carrier of oxygen inside our blood system. Now, the affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen can be affected by five different factors, and we're going to summarize what these factors are. So we're going to examine pH, temperature, carbon dioxide, 2,3-biphosphoglycerate, as well as carbon monoxide. We're also going to discuss how these different factors affect the oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve. So let's begin with factor number one, the pH of our blood plasma. So let's take a look at the following diagram. So this is the cell found inside our tissue. And let's suppose the tissue is exercising. So it has a high rate of metabolism. And what that means is it produces a high concentration of carbon dioxide molecules as a wasteful byproduct. Now these carbon dioxide molecules diffuse across the cell membrane into the extracellular matrix and they, they travel into the blood plasma of the nearby capillary. So this is the wall of our capillary. Now when the CO2 molecules enter the blood plasma, then then travel into the red blood cell. Now, the majority of the carbon dioxide in the red blood cells is transformed into bicarbonate ions and hydrogen ions. So, by increasing the amount of CO2 inside the red blood cell, we also in turn increase the amount of hydrogen ions inside our red blood cells. And because hydrogen ions, the concentration of hydrogen ions determines the pH of our blood plasma, what that means is, a higher concentration of hydrogen ions means a more acidic environment and so a lower pH. Now, what exactly is the effect that hydrogen has on hemoglobin? Well, it turns out that hydrogen ions can actually bind onto special allosteric sites found on our hemoglobin and by binding to hemoglobin, the hydrogen ions effectively decrease the affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen. That means the hydrogen ions make it much more likely that the hemoglobin will release that oxygen. So what that means is because our affinity of hemoglobin to oxygen actually decreases, more of that oxygen is released into the cell of our tissue. So this effect, this phenomenon is known as the Bohr effect. And what the Bohr effect does is it ultimately shifts the entire curve to the right side. So a decrease in our pH is the same thing as an increase in the hydrogen ion concentration. And what this does is it shifts the oxygen hemoglobin curve to the right side. And to see what we mean, let's take a look at the following diagram, the following graph. So the y-axis is the percent saturation of hemoglobin. And the x-axis is the partial pressure of oxygen in the tissues given in millimeters of mercury. Now, the blue curve describes the, uh, the dissociation curve for when we don't have any of these factors in place. So this is the normal dissociation curve. But if we increase our hydrogen ion concentration, thereby decreasing our pH, what that does is it shifts the entire curve to the right side and we get the following dashed curve. And what that means is at the same exact partial pressure of oxygen, we're going to have a smaller concentration percent saturation of hemoglobin and so more of that oxygen will be released to the cells of our tissue. Now what about the temperature? So when our cells are carrying out many metabolic processes, they don't only produce carbon dioxide as a byproduct, they also produce thermal energy. And this thermal energy is transferred into the blood plasma of our capillaries. And what it does is it increases the temperature of the environment within our capillaries. Now, by increasing the temperature of our solution, we ultimately affect the affinity of hemoglobin to oxygen because the hemoglobin is now at a higher temperature. It's moving at a higher kinetic energy. So that means it's not able to hold the oxygen as well as before. 
and what that means is more of that oxygen will be released by the hemoglobin into the blood and more of that oxygen will end up in the cells of our tissue. So just like decreasing the pH, increasing the temperature will also shift the oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve to the right side as seen in the following diagram. So decreasing the pH, which is the same thing as increasing the H plus ion, has the same effect as increasing the temperature of our solution inside our capillaries. Now, what about carbon dioxide itself? So we already discussed the Bohr effect and we said that the majority of the carbon dioxide produced by the cells is absorbed by the red blood cells and then those red blood cells convert the majority of that CO2 into H plus ions and bicarbonate ions but actually a small percentage of that carbon dioxide when it actually enters the red blood cells goes on directly to the hemoglobin and binds directly to the hemoglobin at specific regions regions and once CO2 binds onto the hemoglobin what it does is it decreases hemoglobin's ability to bind to oxygen and once again less oxygen will be bound to our hemoglobin and more oxygen will be ultimately released to the red blood cells in the uh, to the tissues to the cells inside our exercising tissues and this effect is known as the whole Dane effect so an increase in the CO2 concentration in the partial pressure concentration of CO2 inside this area the red blood cells basically shifts the curve once again to the right side so we see that increasing the hydrogen ion concentration increasing the temperature and increasing the partial pressure of carbon dioxide the concentration of carbon dioxide will shift the entire curve to the right side and what that means is more of that oxygen will be delivered to the tissues of our body. Now, what about something called 2,3-BPG? So 2,3-BPG is 2,3-biphosphoglycerate. And 2,3-biphosphoglycerate is a naturally occurring intermediate in the process of glycolysis. So we produce 2,3-BPG when our cells use glucose and break down glucose for ATP. So within our cells that are exercising, they have a high rate of metabolism, they produce an excess of 2,3-BPG molecules. These molecules can pass along the membrane into the matrix and then eventually they end up within the blood plasma and move into the red blood cells. Now, once the 2,3-BPG are inside the red blood cells, they go on to directly interact with hemoglobin. They bind to a special site between the two beta subunits of hemoglobin and they create a conformational change. And by binding to hemoglobin and creating that conformational change, they decrease, they lower the affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen and once again this allows for more, oxygen, uh, for more oxygen to actually be unloaded and more oxygen ends up in the cells of our tissue and once again increasing the concentration of 2,3-BPG will cause a rightward shift on our oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve. So we see that increasing four of these different things will shift the curve to the right and that will make it more likely for hemoglobin to unload that oxygen and deliver more oxygen to the cells of our tissue. So we have increase in H plus ion concentration, increase in temperature, increase in the concentration of CO2, and increase in 2,3-BPG that all create a rightward shift in the hemoglobin dissociation curve. Now, the final factor I'd like to discuss is carbon monoxide. Now, carbon monoxide is actually produced naturally inside our body, but it is produced in very, very, very small amounts. So the CO2, because it's produced in very small amounts in our body, does not actually affect the hemoglobin in any adverse way. But 
we produce carbon monoxide in much more, in much greater concentrations via different types of processes that take place outside our body. For, for example, cars produce CO2 and smoking also produces CO2. So carbon monoxide, as it turns out, is actually a competitive inhibitor of hemoglobin and it competes with oxygen and in fact it, it is 250 times more likely to actually bind to the heme group of hemoglobin than oxygen. Now by binding to hemoglobin, the carbon monoxide creates a conformational change that ultimately increases the affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen. It makes hemoglobin much more likely to bind oxygen. And what that means is, by binding to our hemoglobin, C CO, carbon monoxide, ultimately causes the hemoglobin to not be that likely to release oxygen to the tissues. And so as a result, the tissues will receive less oxygen. Less oxygen will be delivered to the cells of our tissue. And what this means is when carbon monoxide binds to our hemoglobin, it causes a leftward shift in our hemoglobin curve. And not only that, it also lowers the actual curve. And that's because carbon monoxide uh, binds to the heme groups and that means it actually lowers the oxygen carrying capacity of our hemoglobin and that's why we get the following curve for when we have a high concentration of carbon monoxide inside our body. So we have a leftward shift on this side and this entire curve essentially is moved down because, hemo because carbon monoxide lowers hemoglobin's oxygen carrying capacity it actually binds onto the heme group and that prevents other oxygens to bind to the heme groups of hemoglobin and so it decreases the amount of hemoglobin the amount of oxygen that be, uh, that can be carried by our hemoglobin so these are the five different factors that ultimately affect the affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen and affect our oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve